How can you increase the chance that your work gets adopted by business? You need to facilitate the right conversations. And as you'll learn in this episode, as a service designer, you're in a unique position to do that. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Jim Callback. This is the Service Design Show, episode 121. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the things you don't learn in service design school, but do make a huge difference between success and failure, all to help you design services that have a positive impact on people and business. The guest in this episode is Jim Kalbach. Jim wrote several books, including the successful Mapping Experiences and Jobs to be Done playbook. He's also currently the chief evangelist at Mural. In this episode, we're going to talk about the fact that service design, of course, never happens in isolation. So it's not enough to just be very good at the tools and methods. You also need to guide the people you're working with through the process. You need to help them to co-create value. One very effective way to do that is by facilitating the right conversations. Conversations that help people in the organization to make better and smarter decisions. Jim is going to share some of his best practices on how to do that and also some pitfalls to avoid. If you want to grow as a service design professional and learn what it takes to make service design work, make sure to subscribe to the channel because we bring a new video at least once a week that will help to level up your skills. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Jim Kalbach. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you on. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, a lot of people will know your name, will have maybe read uh, some of your books, maybe have seen your LinkedIn profile. But for the people who haven't done that yet, could you give a brief intro about who is Jim? Yeah, sure. Uh, Jim Callback. Uh, I'm the chief evangelist at Mural, uh, one of the leading online whiteboards. I've been with the company for six years. And prior to that, I have a background in design, design strategy in various companies and settings. Uh, and through that work, um, I have uh, three books that I've authored. First, uh, Designing Web Navigation in 2007. That kind of reflects my background in information architecture. Then looking into more strategic aspects of design uh, mapping experiences came out in 2016, uh, which I have a second edition out right now too, Mark. Um, and then also in in 2020, uh, the Jobs to Be Done playbook came out. So I'm a, I'm an author as well. Yeah. And uh, the second edition of Mapping Experiences, is that the latest uh, book or was it or is the Jobs to Be Done the latest one? Now, that's a that's a good question. Mm. In terms of pu publisher release yeah. dates. Yeah. Uh, mapping Experiences is more current okay. than the Jobs to Be Done playbook. But I actually updated the text before I finished the Jobs to be done yeah. one. So they kind of overlapped that Got way. It. I was doing a lot of writing, let's put it that way, in 2019 and 20. <laughs> I can imagine last year was a good year for writing as well. Uh, uh, a lot of spare time. Yeah, we have, exactly. we have a, a rapid fire question round with uh, five questions that you haven't prepared for. And I need to uh, pick them up over here. Um, the goal is to answer these questions as quickly as you can. Don't overthink them. So uh, you haven't prepared for this, which is always fun. Question number one is, what's always in your fridge? What's a uh, beer? <laughs> beer, yeah. Which book are you reading right now? I'm reading a book called The Statue in Stone. It's about jobs to be done philosophy. Oh, wow. Okay. What superpower would you like to have? Uh, flying. Again, uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? When I was a kid, a scientist or like a researcher in a lab. Hmm. And final question, what is your first memory of service design? My first memory of service design, that's a really good question. It might have been uh, like Arne van Nosterum. Uh, I think he gave a talk somewhere that I mm. saw. So mm. 
10, 10 or 15 years ago, something like that. Yeah, Anna, Anna has been on the show, I think, uh, episode three or four or something like that, yeah. way in the Wayback Machine. Yeah, uh, right. good. Yeah, <laughs> it, it might have been a service blueprint, too. I think I came across the Mary Jo Bittner service blueprint also a while back, too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Good, good to know that uh, Anna was influencing and spreading the community <laughs> as early as that. Um, so, uh, Jim, we're going to talk about um, things that make design work in organizations. And uh, we're going to sort of try to unravel why, even though you might have good design, whatever that is, it's still not getting absorbed, adopted by the rest of the organization, right? That's sort of the red thread throughout yeah. the next 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, obviously design skills matter, right? You got to know your craft. Sure. Right. And, you know, all the work that Arna and you do to forward the craft, right? Better service blueprints, better, better service design, just better design in general. That all matters. So we don't want to say that doesn't matter. But there's other parts of the equation to get to something that's delivered, particularly in a commercial context, to actually get that design delivered. Right. And I think yeah. that's what we want to focus on. Yeah. I think there is a lot of has been written about the craft of service design, uh, yeah. and now we want to sort of see what maybe what what are the things that en enable yeah. the craft and let the let us maximize their I don't know the things we get out of the craft. I'm really curious. Uh, maybe this is a sidestep, but after writing mapping experiences. What happened next? Because that was in 2016. You came out with an updated version. Like, what happened in between? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, when so when I so mapping experiences came out in 2016, but I had been engaging in that topic in general. I'd been doing a lot of mapping in my own work um, almost a decade before that, and started writing probably in about 2014. And the questions that I was getting. Um, you know, if I gave a talk or I used to give a workshop on that, I still do give a workshop on that topic. And the questions that I were getting were, were things like, what is a customer journey map? What is the difference between a customer journey map and a service blueprint? And how do I create one? Right. 2014 ish, let's say, right. 2015. Since then, everybody knows what a customer journey map is. And I often, I often do when I, when I give a talk or a workshop, I ask how many people know what a customer journey map is? And everybody raises their hand. And now I'm asking how many people have worked with customer journey maps? If I go to a design conference, it's like almost everybody, right? So uh, the, the other side of that too, is our stakeholders are asking for things like, I'm just using customer journey map as an example here, but our stakeholders are asking for that by name, right? Even if you're in an agency, your phone might ring and they say, I want a customer journey map, right? So that's a good thing, right? So I, I, I don't, it's not about what is or how do I create this thing anymore from both our community and from our stakeholders. I think the big question that I've been seeing in the past five years and six years emerge is <clears throat> how do I make that actionable? Um, I, and I've, I've gotten people to tell me, yeah, I created a customer journey map. I showed it to my stakeholder and they didn't get it. Yeah. Nothing happened. Yeah. There's no impact. They didn't do anything. And my question is, well, how did you facilitate the conversation around it? How did you, together with your team and your stakeholders, how did you make sense of the potential opportunities that the journey map can reveal? And they're like, oh, I didn't. I just, you know, I just sent it as an email. Yeah. Said, well, okay, yeah. No, yeah. that's not enough. You got to facilitate the conversation as well. And, and that's what I really liked when we were preparing this conversation, sort of the topic of facilitating the right conversations. I think right. not just conversations, the right conversations um, and understanding what that is and the, and the importance of that. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we can try to unravel. You mentioned something uh, in our preparation about design always being a team effort, always playing... Uh, part in a bigger context what's the deal with that and how does that link to what we just said yeah i mean i think it's the nature it's the nature of the dif discipline right it tends to be very very public very visible um people other people in the organization can see it and if they have two eyeballs they have an opinion about it as well too just to contrast with let's say you know coding or development right nobody's looking at a developer's code and saying it looks good or not okay it has to work Right. So if there's a bug in there, it'll come back to you. But as you're developing, nobody's looking at it with their opinion. Right. So it's just the nature of the work. And I'm not saying, you know, it's better or worse, but 
our our work we have to we have to kind of wear our work on our sleeve so to speak so and everybody can see it and i think because of that uh as designers we need to embrace that and make design participatory uh throughout the whole journey because what you don't want to do as a designer is get a, get a mission get a brief up, up front and then a month later have the big reveal and uh, I used to do that. And I know as a designer, you like the big reveal. I'm going to go away and do some research. And here's my service blueprint, right? Boom. And here, and then the stakeholders go, yeah, but I don't know where that came from. And they start questioning your method and your data and the validity of it and all this kind of stuff. So it's really about engaging people the whole way, too. Hmm. And uh, what if we don't do that? Or, well, or you, what if we don't do that well enough or enough in general? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you you can have successful projects that have an impact. I think I think the risk of your project becoming derailed um, increases, right? And derailed by uh, the other people around you, right? Because um, they're re regardless of how high ranking you are as a designer or you're in your organization, there are other concerns. There are commercial concerns. There are business concerns, right? And then there are feasibility and technical concerns as well, too. And you have to harmonize all those things. And it's it's rare that a designer is also the business decider and the technical decider all wrapped into one, right? So you just by default, to get something out the door, there has to be a negotiation of those different perspectives in any organization. And I think I think that's an opportunity for designers to lead that negotiation, right? Yeah, yeah. And if we fail to do that or neglect to do that, important decisions are being made without taking the design aspects into account, the, the human aspects into account, it, the decisions are being driven by financials and by engineering, basically. Exactly. I mean, design happens, whether and, it's intentional exactly. by a designer or not, because the thing that goes out the door is designed. Is that what you wanted is the question. Is that the best for the customer and the user? That's the question, right? We um, you just mentioned things happened between 2014 and uh, and 2021 um people are asking different questions now how did we get to this point where we need to have a conversation about facilitating the right conversation why why hasn't that uh, sort of evolved along the way over the years why are we here well i mean yeah, that's a good point. Uh, to some to some degree, it has, and I don't I don't want to say designers aren't facilitators or designers aren't facilitating. Um, I think it needs to be anchored in as part of our discipline more, and and you know almost be like formalized. Like you go to design school, you learn the craft. You also have to learn how to facilitate stakeholder conversations, and sometimes they're really tough. I don't know if you've ever been in a room. If you're in software development, you've been in a room full of engineers. Uh, you know, that can be tough or, or, you know, in front of a bunch of business deciders that, that those can be tough conversations and skills that you don't necessarily learn at design school. So, you know, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that we haven't been doing that. I think we have to do more of it and it has to become, it has to become part of the mindset. Right. Um, and I, you know, I think at least from what I'm seeing, you know, you start, uh, you know, I'm seeing books and articles and, and shows like this that are talking about this topic. So I, I, th I think we're I think we're addressing it. Um, it's just for me, it's just kind of the next frontier, I believe. Yeah, maybe you, it's moving up the ma maturity ladder. And that's yeah, exactly. the, the, the next level requires new skills, different exactly. awareness. Um, exactly, exactly. I, and I'm also curious, like, uh, sometimes the question comes up to me, like, why the design community? Why isn't the tech industry dealing with the same mm -hmm. questions are they already in the is it because we're not in the positions where we have enough influence over decision making yeah. are we are we sort of playing catch up and need to fix that or is there something else going on uh, uh, no i i think i think that's part of it yes and and you know you know as designers we've been pounding our fist on the desk saying we want a seat at the table for a long time and i think rightfully so Right, um, and then you look at books like uh, Maria Judice's uh, "The Rise of the uh, uh, Chief Design Officer," or is it "Design"? I forget the abbreviation that she used, but yeah, yeah, get, getting design into leadership uh, positions, um, and I think that's an awareness of industry in general, businesses in general, of the importance of design um, that 
the position that we're in, I think, is a symptom of design just being and, and you know, you've heard this before too. Uh, you know, aesthetics are just the last thing that you do to get it out the door. It's the polish and things like that, rather than viewing design as a core to what the, the offer is that you're, you know, uh, designing pricing, designing brand, designing the thing. I mean, you know, you can use design in a much broader context. And I think, you know, are the businesses and the companies that we work for are becoming aware, more and more aware of that as well, too. But it's slow, right? Because the mindset uh, has been more around operational efficiency and maximizing profits and things like that. Oh, okay, now I got to understand how design fits in my equation. So I, I, I think we're kind of getting there. But one of the one of the pieces that's missing, and I don't want to make this sound too pedantic or, or kind of uh, please do <laughs> flat. Uh, it, this the is ROI. Your it, it's the ROI, right? It's the ROI. And if we compare to our friends over in the marketing department, right? Marketing is, has been really good about showing their value. Right. Marketers can say, if you put one dollar into my campaign, I'm going to give you two dollars out the other side. Right. It's not so easy with design. And, yeah, there's lots of studies. I have some here on my computer desktop. Right. The Deloitte one that came out last year. And, you know, there's all these studies about the ROI of design. They're there, but they're not anchored in, in the business and the commercial mindset yet. I think we're getting there, though. Yeah. So so that's good news. And it's a great time to be in design because of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just posted a, a post on LinkedIn. I've been posting a lot around the ROI these, uh, discussion on yeah. design. I think we have a lot of education to do, and that's sort of the, yeah. uh, I don't know, the, the heritage or where we're coming from. Like, um, and that, That's part of the job, and that will be for uh, still a very long time. I've been I in uh, so. the service design field for 15 years. And never A day hasn't gone by where, where I hadn't had to educate people about uh, right. what it is and the value uh, it brings. Right. Yeah. So this isn't coming uh, from nowhere for you. I'm sure that you've been in situations where you experienced the lack of facilitation of the right conversation. How did it start for you? When did you, can you give an example, a story? Like where, what, when was it missing? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and, and it also has to do with my, my introduction into, into mapping in general, you know, whether it's customer journey map or service blueprint, I was looking at a range of techniques. Um, this is about, uh, let's see, was it 2021, maybe closer to 15 years ago when I was working for a company called Lexus Nexus and, uh, they, they produce solutions for, for legal professionals, um, usually around finding information and things like that. But we were talking a lot about workflow back then. We want to fit into our customers' workflow. Um, and I started to pick up on this idea of workflow mapping. If, if we want to fit into our, uh, our customers' workflow, then we have to not only understand how they come to our product, like how do they find us and buy us and use, you know, usability of our, of our products, but how do we fit into their workflow? So I started to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at what, what workflow meant and mapping was an obvious way to, 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 to analyze, to diagnose, to research, diagnose and analyze that. Right. Oh, you know, they're not just doing, they're not, they're not just in front of our product all day. They're doing all these other things and they have all kinds of other products around them and trying to kind of piece that together. And guess what? You know, visualizing it as a diagram was the key way to do that. Um, and um, this was working with some colleagues and they said, well, you can't just you can't just make a nice diagram and not have a conversation around it because that's called wallpaper. And I didn't I didn't want to make wallpaper. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't want to make pretty pictures that you just hung up on the wall and everybody said, oh, it looks pretty. So um, I, I started doing these workshops um, at the time I was living in Germany. I was living in Europe. And, you know, going to the French, you know, French business unit in the UK, things like that. I even went to Australia so that I, I you know, I, I started to do, I started to become known for these workshops that I were doing, not the maps. It was the workshops. It was like, oh, we want to do a workshop with Jim, a workflow workshop with Jim uh, and that kind of thing. And that really kind of opened my eyes into how, how you can get those aha moments, right? How you can go from research. Okay, here, here, I did all this research and I put it into a diagram, but then you get this, ah, oh, I see. <laughs> it's not just about us, right? Uh, and that kind of outside in view, right? Uh, and, you know, we're not the center of the universe we view. And, and, you know, you could see it, I could see it on my stakeholders' faces. And that's kind of where it's, I, I didn't recognize it explicitly, but I started to realize, oh, it's the conversation. It's not the map, it's the conversation on top of the map that's important. Mm. And... That's interesting because in our work, we do a lot of 
probably a lot of workshops, a lot of sessions. Uh, yeah. Today we do everything remote through tools like Mural, for instance. Yeah. Um, people might start to question, like, what is what is really our work? Is yeah. it is it are we facilitators? Are we just right. facilitator facilitators or? Are we service designers or right. is there even a distinction? So yeah. like, what's your take on that? I, I, think, I think you have to have multiple hats. Um, and yeah, you have to be, you know, know the craft of service design and you wear that hat, right? And you do your research and create a service blueprint and all the other great things that we do. Um, but I do think, be, and again, this is because of the nature of the discipline. Because it's so open in public and everybody can have opinion on our work, I think you have to open that up and we do have to be facilitators. So you take your hat off of, you know, the craft of service design and you put a facilitator hat on. Uh, and that's, I believe that's part of, of service design as well too. I would even go further because you can look at some of those workshops that I talked about and say, yeah, but what was the impact? You know, did it stick? Did, did, was there follow through? Did you actually launch something, you know, based on that? Um, so I've been, I've been trying to extend that conversation as well too. And think about what is the commitment from the organization to the insight that we brought to them? And are we responsible for that? I think, yeah, actually, we are, too. Do you have the time and the resource to actually follow through on the concepts that you came sure. up in that yeah. workshop? And that's, uh, I think that's a really important uh, thing to note here. Because if you're just a f facilitator, your job ends when sort of the workshop has ended and you've sent yeah. the, the summary to the right. client or the stakeholders. Yeah. And your job as a service designer and workshop is always a means to an end. Like we're doing something that's bigger. We're trying to improve the lives of people. We're trying to make organizations more profitable. That's and and we need conversations for that. Right? That's I think that's a no, that's I, a I key agree. distinction yeah. here. Yeah. 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 If we zoom in into uh your workshop experience, what was if you if you look back on it what were the things in those workshops that uh, that sort of worked? What made yeah. them so effective and so powerful uh, that people kept asking you back to do yeah. them across the globe? Yeah, there's several factors. I think for me, it started with the the diagrams and the visualizations. Uh, and you know, obviously, I write about this in the book that those are compelling artifacts. Right. You could go out and do a ton of research. You could you know, interview 20, 30 people. You could do a month worth of research and summarizing it in a very compact diagram becomes compelling then. Right. I could also write a 20 page report and you know, send that off and say, hey, read my report. People don't read the report. But if you have that compelling artifact that gives an overview, um, it draws people in and it draws people in, in a way that multiple people can have a conversation at the same time as well, too. So it's not a solid, you're not absorbing that insight, you know, on your own, you can do it as, 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 as a team. So setting up the workshops so that the, the kind of the centerpiece that the center of gravity is the diagram. And that's what we use to hang all the conversations off of, but do that together as a team. Right. Um, so the visualization, I think, is a key part to have that catalyst. Um, but also having a multidisciplinary team. And I can't tell you, Mark, how many times I would do these workshops that I was uh, referring to. And, and, you know, even to this day, for that matter, where I was it was the first time that two people uh, on the same team were in the room together, like the marketing team and the engineering team would be like, let's do introductions. Like, oh, I've never met the head of engineering before, you know, and then marketing person. Right. So then so and this is also an opportunity for design as well, too, because as a designer, I was now bringing perspectives across the organization together as well, too, with the diagram being that catalyst for that conversation. And then I think the last thing uh, the last thing is um, uh, just being able to have a different mindset and perspective on things, right? Because the marketing person is looking at things in terms of distribution and the business person is looking at things in terms of optimizing margins and the technical person is looking at things in terms of feasibility. And you put all that away and say, for the next two, four hours, whatever, we're going to think about what the customer is experiencing, right? Yeah. And you rip all that other stuff off. And because the, di and the, and the workshop is structured and the diagram moves from left to right, they have to engage with it, right? And it's that empathy building type of, of uh, exercise that I think is really important. And it's also foundational 
as well too, because people would say, yeah, but Jim, we, we want to, we want to launch something. You, we want to do a workshop and launch something. I'm like, that's not, it's not about that. It's about what happens six months later or a year later, that person in that workshop has a different understanding of the user. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a, you know, in input output equation. It's foundational for the organization to practice a muscle of customer centricity. That's a lot. Yeah. And I totally yeah, sorry agree. about that long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that it's still getting you excited. And um, this is uh, um, also, again, worth noting that our work, the value from our work is emergent. Uh, rather than it's being, uh, it's not a machine uh, where you have input and output, like you said, yeah. which is, which you can isolate, isolate. It emerges from uh, right. creating an environment in which things happen, right? And right. and these conversations contribute to that environment, which is a really tough sell in a lot of organizations if you sort of want to show evidence or prove for the value you're creating for the organization. Uh, we don't have to go into that, but yeah. Well, that goes back to the ROI question. Sure. Well, what's the ROI of practicing a customer-centric muscle uh, you know, across the organization? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but here's what I like to ask, though. Imagine if your company didn't do that. Sure. Imagine if your yeah. company, everybody just worked in their cubicles, they had their tasks in Asana, and, that, and they put their head down, and that's all they did. It's like, well, you wouldn't have imagination or innovation or, you know, thinking empathy and all those other things. So I like to flip the question around when people say, what's the value of that? I was like, well, what, imagine if you didn't do that. Right? Exactly. As yeah. Like, company. what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. like, right. If, exactly. Right. If yeah. the alternative <laughs> alternative is better, let's let's go for that. And um, yeah, the, the the challenge there with flipping it around still is that usually not a lot nobody is accountable for actually doing customer centric things like at yeah. the end of the day after three months or a year and you have your uh yearly review two two little people in our organization are judged by the fact if they have done stuff that pushes the company to be more customer or human centric right yeah exactly and you know some of the stories that i was telling you know, earlier on at lexus nexus i was fortunate enough to come across a stakeholder who was high enough in the organization to kind of push this through and believed in it. He sure. didn't want the ROI calculation because he, he got kind of what, what you're talking about. So one of the recommendations I have of, you know, how do I turn my organization around and get this going is f try to find that champion who is just going to understand the value of it uh, without, without having to have a number attached to it and, and, and attach yourself to him or her. That's it. And, and yeah. this is what, uh, I would love to go into deeper because finding a champion uh, who believes in it is crucial. Have you found mm -hmm. other critical success factors that help to facilitate these conversations? Yeah, um, you, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of design and some of the techniques we're talking about, like workshops and mapping and empathy building and all of those types of things. They're the kind of thing that 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 organizations and the people in those organizations don't know they need until they've seen it or done it. So one of, one of the things to do is also to, to do, to do a pilot or to get started by just getting started. Right. And I know, I know that sounds, uh, that, that sounds redundant or, or oxymoronic in, in its logic there, but if you're, if you're in design and you're, um, and you already have projects and efforts, can you, in a more covert way, can you bring some of these things that we're talking about, engaging stakeholders and workshops and thinking through, can you bring that into your existing projects so that you have an example? Because what if you don't know you need something until you see it, then you need to create, create that thing and show, hey, look what this team did over here to kind of start somewhere small so that you have that example. And then it's like, uh, it's a snowball from there. You know, Then everybody wants it and you become in demand. It's it's exponential growth. I can totally. I think so. Yeah, uh, I can totally uh, recognize that. And um, I I was having conversations uh, with some in-house service designers, and the word experiment or experimentation has uh, uh, arose a lot. Like, don't say you're going to do something new or you that that you want to introduce a new methodology. Say that you're going to do an experiment. Let's let's right. try this new thing. Yeah. And then that's usually enough to right. get started. So, okay. so right, how do you get started? 
propose an experiment. Right. Agree. Yeah. Agree. Let's let's try it out. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then use happens. that as your case. Yeah. Let's and then use that as your as your case study to show other people. Yeah. yeah and tell them afterwards what you've done. <laughs> but, yeah. Exa no. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know I think that's the value of shows like this. Of you know things things you know my books and other other things like that that are out there is that others now other designers Mark can hold those things up as examples. And say, well, maybe we didn't do it here, but they're doing it over there. And by the way, that was one thing that motive that, that got me, uh, my organization uh, motivated earlier on, way, you know, way back when, was that uh, there was a, actually an HBR article, Harvard Business Review article, that showed that our competitor was doing some of these things. Oh, that was gold for me, because fear. Fear, look, our competitors are doing it, right? Oh, okay, let's you know do do the workshop, and you know then then suddenly doors open for me when I found when I found out that our competitors were doing this kind of work. Gold, yeah, yeah I, totally I've heard, gold. yeah, I've heard this one uh, a few times on the show, but it's also good to emphasize this one. Just look at what the market is doing, and nobody yeah, exactly. in the organization wants right. to be a lagger. Like we right. don't we, exactly like you said, it's fear. We don't want to miss out um, yeah. and yeah. just. Shoving those HR articles on the on the right desks, and that <laughs> right. that is a very very effective strategy. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, so just you know, find a champion, do a small project in a in an undercover way, find what other people are doing. These are some of the things that you and if you do all of those three things, you can you can kind of get started. I mean, it depends on where your organization is, but you can move things along. Yeah, it's, it starts to create momentum. Now, yeah, exactly. Um, you also mentioned that. We are probably already doing parts of this. Maybe not conscious, but uh, we are already facilitating conversations to uh, some degree. What do you feel is the thing that's missing the most in the current situation? I, I think it's the follow through. It's what it's what happens, right? So we said, okay, it's not about the map. It's about the conversation around the map. And now, okay, now we can facilitate conversations. I think it's the next step, right? And I can't tell you how many times, Mark, I've ended a workshop with a wall full of sticky notes. I take a photo of it, transcribe those, and go back to my stakeholder and say, here, we save the company. It's in there somewhere. You figure it out. Mm. We save the company with our brainstorming section. That's not enough. You have to then prioritize and get the, the resources and the time, the resources and the time, to do further experiments on those things, right? Because an innocent little sticky note with an idea is not ready to go to market yet. There's a big gap from my sticky note to go to market. There's a gap that we have to start filling. I think that's the next frontier. Does an example or a story come to your mind when you think of when it has occurred in your situation? Yeah, yeah, it, it did. It was at my last company uh, that I worked for, Citrix. Um, and, uh, we, we did, I did a mapping exercise in a workshop and, you know, based on my, my, my past experience, I had already been thinking about this. So rather than saying, we're going to do a brainstorming session and come up with the idea that's going to save the company, which you always do in those workshops, you always think you save the company, right? Um, I said, we're going to do a workshop and we're not going to come out with ideas. We're going to come out with experiments. So I actually set the expectation that there's no development that's gonna happen. You're not gonna go from sticky note to development. We're gonna go from sticky note to experiment. And I actually invited a project manager to the workshop. It was like a multi, it was like a little design sprint type thing, right? And I had a project manager there in the workshop for the whole time, whose sole purpose it was to capture everything as experiments so that at the end of the workshop, we didn't have a wall full of sticky notes. We had a project plan for experimentation at the end of the workshop. I Classic, uh, super good strategy. I remember that I once uh, sold a project where we said, we're going to provide you with five experiments, but I need to know yeah. upfront that you'll have the budget and the right. time to actually follow up on those experiments because right. they, they wanted a customer journey map. And then uh, right. my question was, what are you going to do with them? And eventually they wanted to become, I don't know, that they had business objectives, and we said we're going to come up with experiments to help you achieve that business objective. But I need to know that you'll be able to take the next step. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to actually engage in this project. And it worked. Like just right. having that conversation. Yeah, uh, agree, agree. Made it happen. What's the follow through? Now I'm going to ask you, Mark. Is that part of design? So now, now we have to know the craft of design. We have to know facilitation, and now we have to know business experimentation. Is that part of design? Yes. Uh, if you, I, I, I think, uh, I think so, and the reason why I think so is because I 
uh, evaluate the impact of our work by tangible change in the outside world. So did, did we actually, does somebody experience something different after we're done with our work? And it can take a long time before that's the case, but uh, that's sort of the, the measure stick that I use to see if we're making progress. What do you think? I agree wholly with you. <laughs> I, I I couldn't agree more. Boring. I think that is that it's it's another. I just, sorry about that, but yeah, it's another hat that that designers have to wear. But if we want to have this impact, if we want us to have a seat at the table, we have to be able to have those conversations as well yeah. too. What is your commitment? What is your follow through and the commitment to that follow through before I get started with my design research? And, and but I get your question, and it's a valid question that I again have seen on uh, social media coming by, like. We, I think we as designers feel responsible of actually following through. I think part of this is because uh, we're makers by nature and we want to put things into the world. But sometimes it feels like we're the only ones that care if things <laughs> actually follow through. And that's a big weight yeah. to have on our shoulders. What's your yeah. experience with that? Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's the responsibility of design as a discipline. And I think that's that's where we need to start moving to. And that takes us then into questions around organizational design and who, ha, what is the decision making process in, in an organization? Right. Um, can, here's a here's a great question. It, can anybody in an organization stop a release or stop launching something because the design is off? And, and, you know, the answer is usually no, that, you know, companies are willing to ship things with, with, a, with a compromised design over, uh, you know, a good business model and great technology behind it, right? Uh, but is there somebody in the organization that can say, guys, we can't launch that, the design's not right, and push it back? And very often the answer is no. So we, we feed, we feed our, 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 our work into this machine, this decision-making machine, where, which we, where there's nobody to, to, to pull the brakes or to steer it anymore. And then you cross your fingers and you hope the thing that comes out in the market has to do with what you, uh, what you designed, uh, you know, whatever, a year earlier sometimes, right? It's a long time in advance sometimes. So that's the current status. But how do we change that? I think it's I think it's by continuing to to uh, to expand our our remit, at, you know, right? Moving from craft to facilitation to business experimentation. Okay, now let's put our remit on. Uh, I don't know what the next circle is there, Mark. To be honest with you, but you know, l launch uh, launch health, you know, design health at launch or something like that, right? You know, and thinking about how we can move all the way into that direction as well, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh Maybe uh, it's about feeling ownership of making an impact on business and yeah. on people, like Agreed. right. And and I don't think maybe we have we the feeling of ownership uh, regarding our customers, but not so much the feeling about yeah. ownership of helping the company to be successful, or at, at least not explicit enough. Uh, agree, agree. And I think it's the feeling of ownership and being able to take ownership, even if you're not the de decision maker, which is very hard to do. But I also believe it's ownership of, yeah, you need owners all the way through as well, too. I think it's top and bottom. It's bottom, bottom up and top down as well, too. And I think the more, you know, I don't think we're th we're there yet in most organizations. Some are there, but most aren't. Um, and I think it's it's just perseverance and us as a discipline trying, you know, trying to recognize it first of all, Mark. Like you and I are bringing this out. I, ho I hope others are benefiting from this conversation. Um, and then and then thinking about what you can do from the bottom up and the top down at the same time. We've been talking uh, a lot about things we need to start doing, <laughs> doing more, and like I, I already hear people moaning at the other end of the uh, headset, more work, more stuff, more things I need yeah. to learn. It's getting bigger and more holistic. Do you think there are things we need to stop doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, it seems to be additive, right? It's, we have to do this and that other thing now, but what, what can we take away? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, maybe not take away, but like less of maybe, um, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I cringe when I, when I hear a, you know, young design team talk about, you know, a discovery phase 
we need to go into discovery and and you know it's this long i don't know it's it's almost discovery theater at times you know to take the theater aspect of what we do away and just get to the get to the meat as quicker you know like because that's what your organization wants as well too so i think sometimes we have a little bit of how ceremony around yeah, what we well, do well, how do you experience that ceremony what does it look like how does it look like um yeah it, it's um th there's a there's a lot of buzzwords <laughs> and a lot of uh a lot of activities that go into it persona creation and all these other things and discovery and we have to do more user research uh and all that stuff and i'm not saying that's bad so i'm not saying cut that out but how can we make that like leaner right because you, you know instead of instead of ha having this fat thing up front is like let's take some of that energy and put it at the other end like we're talking about now right and because th that that stuff evaporates but you know we, we were talking about kind of this this chain right of from insight to action to actually launching right and it's like let's take some of that energy from up front and put it towards the end right you know that kind of thing i don't know exactly what the, what what you would what you would lose uh so i'm not being specific here but i just feel like there's a lot of energy up front that we need to kind of save kind of a marathon we're, we're running a marathon and not a sprint you know what i mean yeah yeah i totally agree yeah, we, right. um there was an episode and i don't recall the name i'm sure it will pop up in a second otherwise i'll add it to the uh show notes where we uh were talking about leaner service design and the yeah. concept where that was sort of proposed was um do research by creating stuff so yeah make things that that people can test in uh, in the real world whether it's yeah. your colleagues whether it's customers and then uh, get feedback from that and use that to drive momentum okay. rather than yeah going out doing a bunch of interviews that's again like you said that's that's valuable and important but it's harder to sell and you have to have more confidence buy-in recognition that you want to do that Yeah, no, that, that that's a great point. And 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 don't get me wrong, and everybody listening as well, too. I just wrote a book on jobs to be done, which is as upfront as you can get about you know trying to find that unmet need. And I don't want to say that's not important, but but as you were just saying, you can find the unmet need, but you don't it there's also research that you need to do with a thing, with a solution, right? As well, too. And you can understand, here's the thing: you can understand the need when you when you have that thing in your hand as well too so so get quicker to having that thing whatever that is right in fact there's a there's a lesser known book out there by a friend of mine um called presum uh i don't want to say um wait what the heck's the name yeah presumptive design i don't know if you know that book by no. Leo frischberg it's called presumptive design where, where it basically says start your design research with a thing it doesn't matter what it is Just go go into a go into a session or a workshop and pull a thing out and say our our service is like this. Why is our service like this thing, right? And that's like and a the, carabiner yeah, and thing. The, yeah. And you start doing research with it with an artifact, exactly. not with yeah. you, you know not with interviews. That there, kind there, of thing. there was a poster <laughs> behind me for a long time which said "No prototype, no meeting," which uh, is a <laughs> phrase yeah. stolen from again somebody who I can't recall at this moment. But that thing. Um, can be anything, like you said. You, yeah, you yeah. have something to talk about. And I think right, right, uh, yeah. uh, getting uh, closing um, that cycle between right. uh, research, yeah. creation, right, being faster with that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's the thing. Get to the thing. But you, the, the, here's the point, though. Your research doesn't stop. You're still researching. You're, you're just always doing researching. that research. Right. Yeah. You're always researching. Exactly. Right. So this it, maybe it's maybe it's instead of being waterfall, be more iterative. Right. Let's do all the research, find the unmet need and then bet the farm on the unmet needs. No, mm -hmm. let's get to something really quick yeah. and continue the yeah. researching. Yeah. Right. So that's my beef with the double diamond. I have a, a video <laughs> on that. Uh, and I'll. Uh, very briefly touch upon this for the people who haven't seen that video like it misrepresents often what the design process is it sort of yeah. shows like the research ideation i don't know uh prototyping and then delivery right. or something like that that's not what we do in in right. reality what we do in reality is within a day we do research creation and, and learning right. that that happens within a day and that exactly what the double diamond or there is progress in the design pro uh, process but that progress is from going something which is very low fidelity and very uninformed to something which is high fidelity and more informed that's that's the true 
progress in the design process. I agree. And you know what? One way that I've seen that manifest itself is with the figure eight, just a, yeah. a loop like yeah. this, right? Yeah. Design, IBM design thinking has a figure eight. I have it in my, in my jobs to be done book. It's a figure eight. Jeff Gotthelf on the cover of his book has a figure eight. You're not going to be able to unsee this mark now. But figure eights are all over the it's place. It everywhere. used to be three circles. It used to be three circles of a Venn diagram, right? And information architecture is at the center. Now it's, everything's a figure eight. And I think, I think why we're seeing all these figure eights out there is exactly what you what you said is that we're trying to get away from this linearity of a waterfall double diamond approach. And we're trying to talk, this is for ourselves, but also for our stakeholders. We're trying to show that no, I'm a designer, I'm gonna be doing this. This my day looks like a figure eight. Exactly. It doesn't look like exactly. a line. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, what you said your day looks like this. It's not your right. six months look like right. this. Well, your day and, and your week and the month and the sure. project looks yeah. like this as sure. well too, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, the smallest atomic unit looks like this. And right. I know people will be commenting like, uh, yeah, the double diamond is about converging divergent. I agree with that. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a very good purpose of the double diamond, but uh, yeah, adding design stages and phases in there is not smart. I'm curious, um, how would you know that you're on the right track like what is the difference before and after facilitating the right conversations mm -hmm. how do you know how do you know it's working yeah that's that's a good question i think i think you can you can answer that question in two ways one is internal and the other is external right and so just focusing internal because we're kind of talking a little bit about the dynamics of your organization as well too um, it's a, it's a good question. I should probably come up with a nice list or a blog post on this. Uh, but I think, I think there are, there are immediate cues that you get from, from the session, just the, the engagement and the leaning in that people do, right? Are people leaning in, uh, and, and participating and, and engaging you in conversations or are they like looking at their watch and folding their arms and leaning back? Uh, th th those are kind of metaphors there, but you, uh, so Not I don't know the metaphors. concrete answer. Well, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're manifestations of it, but how do you know a group of people is with you and leaning into your concept, right, or not? It's, it's a really good question. I think it's part of facilitation as well, too. Having that awareness, are, is the group with me, right? You know, head nodding, all that kind of stuff. But are they really, are they really internalizing it, right? That, that's, a, that's a deeper question, right? Um, and it's some of those things, you know, the head nodding, the leaning in, the people engaging, that kind of thing. But here's one of my biggest measures of success, right? When you hear your words, you see your map or your persona in somebody else's presentation. And I've had that happen to me where a business stakeholder like almost took my slide deck from my workshop, made it his own and presented it to somebody higher up, right? Didn't give me credit for it. So I could have been offended, but I saw it as victory, right? When our stakeholders are using our words, we win. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally agree. And uh, when you're, yeah, when they steal and remix the things you've said, yeah. when they, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, two episodes ago it was also it was Ryan Rumsey who said, uh, "Learn the art of having other people have your way." What was it? Yeah, I don't know the exact phrase, but <laughs> yeah, Let the, yeah, no, 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 it's a big it's a big measure of success too because that's that foundational internalization that I was talking about. The effect of this isn't oh we do a workshop and we get a feature out of it. It's we 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 do we do these sessions and, and there's this internalization there's this culture of this and people start regurgitating that that that's a clear sign that yeah. you're on the right track yeah are they are they running with it is right. it is it you who has to send right. out the notes and ha, ha, is there a pull or a push that's factor correct. right when pull you when you go to, one. yeah exactly yeah, when you go to pull when people start nodding you uh pulling your your arm when are you ready when when do we have the Right. Whatever, then you know that uh, right. something good, something good is happening. Agree, agree. What's what's your, what would you say is your biggest lesson, and maybe your biggest mistake when you look back on, yeah, the facilitation of the right conversation. I'm com keep coming back to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a little uh, a naivety that that I had, and maybe I still have it too about how the organization makes decisions in the end about the 
about their business, about go to market. Uh, it was actually, actually, if I were to pick one thing, it would be go to market, how businesses think about the go, go to market motions, right? A lot of businesses think about go to market separate from R&D, right? And you have those terms in a, in a balance sheet, right? You'll have, what, what was our spend on go to market? What was our spend on R&D, right? We're on the R&D side, Mark, by the way, right? Uh, innovation, product, experience. We create the thing and, and then other people bring it to market, right? And I think there was a naive, naivety that I had about um, the, the go-to-market decision-making process. Uh, to, to some degree, it was a lack of knowledge, and th there are lots of other things. There are lots of other concerns: marketing, sales, brand, uh, you know, bottom lines, all kinds of things that go on in kind of the business side. Uh, on the other side of the coin, too, and you know, particularly now with my position at Mural, I'm much closer to our go-to-market motions. There's also dysfunction there as well, too that I was naive about, uh, but that dysfunction beats our dysfunction. So the decision-making on the go-to-market side often trumps uh, decision-making on the R&D side of businesses. So it was kind of that macro, macro understanding of business in general. And then within that, all of the organizational dynamics that take place as well too, uh, that I was, I was kind of naive about that. And I really thought I was going to, you know, I, and I, I made this joke earlier in the show, Mark, where I talked about, I saved the company. Right. My my wall of sticky notes is going to save the company. And you have that kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, as, as a particularly as a younger designer, when I was a younger designer, that kind of, you know, uh, happiness and, and, and delight about, ah, I just say we got the best idea. No, all I have to do is bring that over and they're going to go, oh, my God, why didn't we think of this before? Let's invest in this. And they didn't. Right? And I was like, oh, wait, why didn't you do that? So there was a naivety about how the, the business works and how decisions get made, I think, was, was my biggest mistake. So that was your biggest mistake. And what, what happened? What did you do to overcome that? Like, what's the biggest leap you took to... Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it's really just pushing, right? Sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's really hard because you feel like you're not making progress. But... It's a belief that the things that we that we we're talking about and the things that we believe in, Mark, right? Research, unmet needs, mapping, engaging people in conversations. It you have to believe that that's going to make a difference, right? Um, and I and I always did, and I never let anybody tell me otherwise. Even even if the you know the big dysfunctional go to market decisions were being made, I still held my ground and persevered and just kept going. Mm. So it's you know it's, it's perseverance is really the only way to kind of get through. I believe. <clears throat> And I guess it ha it must also be curiosity because when when sort of you're you get frustrated when you see that the ideas that come up don't don't follow through don't create the impact that you want uh, you have to be curious and learn what is going on what are the dynamics what can I do the next time to actually increase the chance for success so that it's not just me who who wins but everybody wins so I. I there must be curiosity in there as well. Absolutely, I, you know, I think that's a great word, and and I think you hit you hit the nail on the head. The curiosity feeds the perseverance, right? Is you know, I I did this cycle, and it didn't have the impact. It had impact, but not the impact that I wanted. How might I change that in the future? And continuing that, with that curious mindset. Yeah, r rather than going into blame mode and uh, yeah, saying right. they don't understand it, like right. Uh, but, and being you know, so being curious about about your own organization and about your own business and about your own team and things like that. I've heard people say, say things like, "If your organization can't change, change your organization," which is basically saying, "If they, if they, you know, if they don't get it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be curious about how I can change that mindset." Right? I, I always thought, no, it, that's the that's the challenge. Is uh, you know, if 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 an organization doesn't quote unquote get design at the level that we're talking about it here, why not? Be curious about that. How yeah. might you change that? Yeah. What else can you do? Yeah. How, what other, how can you take a method, you know, and things that, that you talk about on your show, how can you take that and make it into the next thing, right? And that's, I think, sort of the essence what we're trying to get across with this show that uh, it's super important to learn the craft. But when you get into an organization, when you get uh, out of service design school, out of service design books, um, that's way not enough that's not a right expression but uh you, you will see that there are many me missing pieces to the puzzle that you that you have to learn and you have to get good at and you have to uh understand i i more and more using the reference to there are other games that need to be played and yeah. you need to 
learn those games, enjoy those games, and start playing them to your best ability. No, I think that's it. It's about embracing that, right? You can either run away from that or you can embrace that as part of your challenge. Yeah. And I hope that we're raising awareness to those games and that people will start Googling, learning, watching YouTube videos on how to do that. How would you summarize our last 45, 50 minutes? Yeah, I think I think we just summarized it actually pr pretty well. It's about being curious about all of the problems around you, starting with your craft, but then what are the other problems uh, on why <clears throat> why bad design happens, right? Bad design doesn't happen because of a lack of knowledge of design, service design, or UX, or any of those other things uh, as a craft, right? Bad design happens because there's this other factor in the middle, in the equation, uh, and it's about um, being curious about that and embracing it, literally embracing it, not running away from it. Nice. When people want to reach out to you and uh, continue this conversation, what's the best way to do that? Where can they find you? I think the best way right now is LinkedIn. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on LinkedIn, so you can reach out and connect with me there. And then you can send messages there too. So that's one reason I like LinkedIn. You can say hello through a message, but also on Twitter as well too. So it's at Jim Callback, no dot, no under, underline, just Jim Callback on Twitter. And then you can find me on, on LinkedIn as well too. Um, I also have a, a blog. I don't blog too much. I shouldn't even mention the blog. Forget the blog, Mark. Forget the blog. Uh, <laughs> cut this part out. That's so, that's so 2004. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is, yeah. And then you have this blog stress. And then at some point in time, you just declare bankruptcy. Oh, I haven't blogged in two years. Screw my blog, right? Mm. Uh, but um, you no, know, I have a new website, a new project that's called the Jobs to be Done Toolkit. Uh, based on my last book as well too. So it's jtbdtoolkit.com. And we have uh, we have some online learning. Uh, we also have live workshops and uh, we have some resources there as well too. But once a month we have a webinar. In fact, I'm doing a webinar tomorrow. So if you go to jtbtoolkit.com, you'll find the, the webinar. It's basically um, uh, an open community kind of forum thing where you know I get on and it's an AMA and we have a discussion there as well too. So there's a little bit of a community feel with, with the toolkit as well. Cool. I'll make sure to include all the links in the show notes. The webinar, your reference probably won't be tomorrow because we're recording at a different date than we are oh, publishing this video as, as <laughs> happens. Uh, uh, February yeah. 4th. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but we do one every month. So, so check it out. Check it out. Um, and you can stop by and say hello on one of my webinars. Awesome. Tim, uh, Tim no, Jim. Thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, thanks for the passion. Thanks for uh, getting so excited about this and raising awareness uh, to this topic. Well, thanks for having me. I, I hope I hope folks uh, got something out of the episode. What did you get out of this conversation with Jim? Leave a comment down below and share your most useful insight. If you know somebody who might enjoy this conversation as well, grab the link and share that with them. If you made it this far, you're apparently enjoying these conversations. And if you would like to see more, make sure to click that subscribe button because we bring a new conversation like this once every two weeks. So you don't want to miss out. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.